March the 20th, 2003, armed forces from Russia and China launched a full-scale invasion of Iraq. Moscow and Beijing claimed the support of two other countries, including the Marshall Islands and Rwanda, in a coalition of the willing. The attack was immediately condemned by France, with Britain and the United States questioning the legality of the invasion and calling for urgent action from the Security Council. Russian President Putin and Chinese President Hu Jintao insisted their action was in response to the threat from Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. More than three weeks after the regime's downfall, no such weapons had been located, and President George W. Bush and Tony Blair have demanded a high-level meeting with Russian and Chinese leaders. So there we are, a quick reminder of recent events in Iraq, although obviously some of the names were changed for legal reasons. <laughs> Though strangely enough, not the Marshall Islands and Rwanda, both of which were claimed as key allies by Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> the war effectively ended four weeks ago, although, as we're about to discover, for some it won't be over until the whole of the Middle East is under American control and Al Jazeera starts showing repeats of friends. <laughs> I, I'm, I'll miss Al Jazeera. I mean, don't you find, it's a great channel. I was just hooked. I mean, obviously it didn't have the satirical edge of Fox News. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll miss John Simpson as well. Isn't it? You can get these channels with others... Wouldn't it have been fantastic if, you know, he took his face off <laughs> and there was Saddam. Yeah. <laughs> Bin Laden. <laughs> Doc Cotton. <Yeah. laughs> it was an extraordinary war in many respects. The first time reporters had spent the war embedded with frontline troops. The first time a British Prime Minister had spent the war embedded in the President. <laughs> they haven't found any weapons of mass destruction, the official reason for war, but they did manage to find four letters about George Galloway. <laughs> Well, I, I used to go to sleep at night counting Iraqi civilian casualties. I, uh, I can't do that anymore. There aren't enough of them. You know, like get to 1750, 7080, it's uh, still 11 o'clock. You know, Letterman hasn't started yet. So the war may be over, but battle for hearts and minds is proving harder. Let's face it, it's a bit difficult to win Iraqi hearts and minds when you leave their hearts in one place and their minds in another. But that doesn't stop them from trying. So let me get this straight. We're going to beam this into their homes? That's right, sir. It's hearts and minds. So what have we been showing them up to now? Mostly reruns of I Love Lucy. Has that been winning their hearts? Right now it's driving them out of their minds. Don't forget, this is the cradle of civilization, sir. The greatest names from our earliest history came from this part of the world. Fred Flintstone was an Iraqi? They need you, sir. So what do I have to do? It's all there on the screen for you, sir. You just got to show your face. They, they haven't seen you for a while, and they're wondering if you're still alive. So I just have to come over like I usually do? We really need you to come across a little different. Uh, humble, even. Do it like if this was an election, you'd win most of the vote. I didn't even have to do that back home. Don't forget, sir. We too have values they can share. They have nothing to fear. My fellow Iraqis. For years, you have suffered at the hands of a brutal dictator. Suffered as your family and your loved ones were killed or disappeared to places you were not able to see them. And all that time, you were fed a constant diet of propaganda on state-owned television as your rulers used the power of the media to promote themselves and the so-called benefits of their regime. Those days are gone. From today on Toward Freedom, we will broadcast to you at a time of our choosing such information and advice as you may need to fulfill your destiny as an independent state. <laughs> Folks, let me be clear. We do not seek to conquer your country. We intend to set you free. We will not seek to benefit in any way from your suffering. You have a fine country with many fine religions, many fine traditions, and, many, and, and some historical artifacts. <laughs> we have a rich supply of resources. We do not seek to exploit those resources nor take from your country any more than is strictly necessary under the normal and accepted rules of international trade and shareholder value. <laughs> Be assured of one thing. We will not walk away from your country 
as others have done before. We will not stay in your country, as others have done before. We will do both, <laughs> to the best of our ability, selflessly, indefinitely, and for as long as it takes. So help us, Allah. Still, we mustn't begrudge the coalition its victory. As it happened, the war lasted three weeks, and the fall of Saddam's statue resulted in scenes of jubilation never seen before, except for the odd edition of Scrap Heap Challenge. <laughs> what was clear was that we were watching history in the making. Here is a quote from the American consul in Baghdad, writing to the State Department in Washington. The name of the president is upon the lips of the people of Baghdad a great deal these days. By Muslims, Christians, and Jews, it is invariably the president who is mentioned as the representative of a disinterested nation which is seeking to secure the liberties and happiness of the oppressed people of the world and a reign of justice and righteousness for all. Uh, does that sound unlikely? It's true, though, except the president in question was Woodrow Wilson and the year was 1919. <laughs> what a different world it was then. British forces had invaded Iraq and were occupying Baghdad. But of course, they told the Arabs it would only be temporary. Yes, it's another triumph for the British Empire. Uh, we try not to use the word triumph, Tristram. Oh, uh, why, sir? Because it's triumphalist. At all cost, we must avoid triumphalism. Um, what do we say instead? I think we can say we are mildly gratified. Yes. Isn't that being mildly gratifiedist? No, not at all. We can now look forward to the creation of a rock which, for the first time, will be free, prosperous, and democratic. And uh, how long do you think that will take? No, yeah, not long. No. Yes, it's another triumph for the Atlantic Coalition. Sorry, uh, I keep saying triumph. <laughs> yes, well, anyway, we can now look forward for the first time in its history to a free, prosperous and democratic Iraq. Yes, how long do you think that will take? Oh, not long, not long. The trouble is, the Americans, they have no idea how to deal with the Arabs. I mean, look at this assembly that they're setting up. I mean, it's a complete farce. I know. You see, the Americans seem to think the only Arabs fit to run the country are ones who haven't set foot in it for 45 years. Well, basically, the problem is, you see, the Americans have no sense of history. None, no. Ironically, when Britain conquered Iraq in the 20s, that's pretty much what the Americans thought about us. We'd set up a so-called Council of State in 1920, supposedly as the first step towards an Arab government. Thomas Owens, the American consul, wasn't impressed. The whole show seems to be a farce and no steps have yet been taken which indicate a sincere desire to set up an autonomous government in Mesopotamia. Something had to be done, and the man to sort it out was Winston Churchill, then colonial secretary. He immediately called a conference of all the foremost experts on Iraqi affairs. Here is a photograph of them. <laughs> if you look carefully, you can see that two of them were actually Arabs. <laughs> Three years later, the British army was still in Iraq, and having the kind of trouble with the locals that today's coalition had become familiar with. John Randolph, Owen's successor as American consul in Baghdad, reported to Washington in 1924, whole areas of the country are scenes of robbery and pillage. But Randolph did see some glimmers of hope. It does not appear possible to deny that the British and Iraqi authorities have accomplished much toward the introduction of order, government and justice into this troubled center of the country. Although he pointed out that this had been mostly achieved by what the British called visitations, a euphemism for bombing tribal villages. <laughs> we can't go on bombing these people, Archie. It's too jolly expensive. Uh, we try not to say bombing, Tristram. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So we, we can't go on visiting these people. We'll run out of um, um, visiting cards. You mean bombs? Yes, exactly. Surely we have to set up a proper Iraqi government run by Iraqis for Iraqis. So they can bomb each other. Well, that's a decent thing to do. The question is, what sort of government? Well, the same sort that we've got, obviously, a constitutional monarchy. It's the noblest form of government there is. Yeah, I mean, good God, if it's good enough for the British Empire, it's good enough for the camel shaggers. And once we talk about Western values, Tristram, our job is done. And we can leave with honor. Precisely. In fact, the British didn't leave, either with honor or without it, till 1958 when we were kicked out by Arab nationalists. The king, the crown prince, and the prime minister were all slaughtered. 
So much for constitutional monarchy, and so much for Woodrow Wilson's hopes for a reign of justice and righteousness for all. But as we all know, they weren't and aren't the only reasons for invading Iraq. There is strategic self-interest. Uh, Great Britain has a special reason, you getting this? Uh, to fear a great Islamic combination throughout Asia directed at the West. Iraq, for its geographical position, may be regarded mm, as a key position. The existence there of a strong Arab state friendly to the British government, breaking the chain of possibly hostile influences, may be of immense importance to use in the difficult times ahead. If you replace the words Great Britain with the word America, you have today's solution to a problem we thought we'd solved 80 years ago. Well, you know, as somebody once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, I've forgotten who said that. <laughs> What's striking about Iraq's history is how often the West has intervened, often to overturn the disastrous effects of the last intervention. When Abdal Karim Kazim seized power and kicked the British out in 1958, he began a bloody and repressive regime. But that was okay because Iraq was still seen as a buffer against the Soviet Union. It was only when Kazim changed his allegiances the following year and started to deal with the Russians that the head of the CIA declared Iraq the most dangerous spot in the world. It was time for the Americans to engineer a little regime change and a plot was hatched to assassinate the Prime Minister. The man at the centre of the plot was a 22-year-old thug described as having no class. The attempt ended in farce. The young assassin killed the wrong man, winged the Prime Minister and was accidentally shot in the leg by a colleague. <laughs> he then had to be bundled out of Iraq and shunted around Beirut and Cairo under CIA protection. So, who was the CIA's bungling henchman and would-be assassin? Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Whatever happened to him? Uh, we don't like killing people, obviously. I think it's worth making that point. But given the low death toll, I think it's a couple of thousand civilians, more soldiers, obviously, um, it was certainly lower than the figure that we budgeted for and <laughs> you know, the calculation that Tony had made beforehand. And given that low death toll, um, I, think we're, I think we're rather in credit. Uh, I think we've got quite a few bodies in the bank for next time. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, General... You planned the strategy for British operations against Iraq. Yes, yes. Well, let me qualify that slightly. No. <laughs> uh, no, um, it, it was, uh, the plan was drawn up actually by an American general, but I copied it out. And, <laughs> which I may say was a, a procedure not without difficulty. The basic... Uh, objectives of the coalition were the, the same, thrust. weren't they? Yes, the British and Americans have both agreed that unless we invaded Iraq, then uh, our two countries were in direct and immediate, uh, under direct and immediate threat from Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. And uh, what, uh, what proof do you have of that? Proof? Good yes. God, proof. <laughs> well, it's absolutely clear, isn't it? I mean, we... We invade in Iraq, and as a result, we haven't been in, uh, attacked by Saddam Hussein. <laughs> I mean, I don't see what more proof you, you want. No. <laughs> um, perhaps not. But um, people might say, you know, the war's yes. been over now for seven weeks. Yes. And yet you haven't found any weapons of mass destruction. Oh, yes, that's now, what they're always, that's what everybody says. <laughs> But what is the answer to that? A complete and conclusive answer to that question was given by the Secretary of State for Defence. Jeff Hoon. I'm afraid so. Um, <laughs> in in a, a, a radio interview, Radio 4, on the 24th of April. I see. And he said that the reason that we haven't found the weapons of mass destruction are, is, uh, is that Saddam Hussein had so much notice, so much warning, prior warning of our uh, uh, invasion, that he had plenty of time to dismantle these weapons and bury them in remote parts of the country. 
But then, I mean, some people might say that if he had these weapons of mass destruction when we invaded the country, why didn't he use them against the coalition forces? Ah, well, no, the Secretary of State had a complete and conclusive answer to that as well. In really? the very, very same interview, and he said the reason that, that, uh, for that was that uh, Saddam Hussein was taken so much by surprise. <laughs> Uh, and I had so little warning of our attack <laughs> that he was unable to organize the use of these weapons. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> could I just uh, point out as gently as I can that um, those explanations are mutually contradictory. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it means that you can have one explanation or the other explanation, but you can't have both. Well, have the one you like. I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, you're very lucky, I think, it seems to me. It's, it, well, all right then, if you don't like those, what about this one? Um, <laughs> what about this one? Uh, the reason we have found any weapons of mass destruction is that they may have been accidentally destroyed by our weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> well, I suppose that is possible. Well, there you are then, and I made that up entirely myself. <laughs> really? Mm. Can I ask you, um, With... if the um, conflict is extended yes. and um, we're going to invade, what, Syria and possibly Iran, I mean, would you support that? Well, no, you, you know, the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Boyce, has made it crystal clear to Mr Blair that, that he, he can't have another war for two years. But won't that rather restrict the Prime Minister's choice of action? Yeah, that's, that's his problem. He's got to deal with that any way he can. Hi, uh, my name's Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. And I'm a warmonger. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel awkward. It's the first time I come to a meeting of warmongers anonymous. <laughs> but, you know, I, I haven't had a war for, what, three, four weeks okay. now. Mm. Yeah. But it's just, you know, it's just that thing about, you know, are you going to relax? Because, you know, I, I just thought I could handle it. Yeah. You know, I just thought, well, you know, one war won't be a problem. And, Oh, God, I've had, what, five in the last six years? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I know they say that you should keep away, away from awkward, difficult situations and dangerous situations, but, you know, it's not always easy. I'm in the Security Council and, and, and you know, I can see all the people sitting there, all the different nations, and I just kind of get this urge to bomb them. <laughs> and, and I've just got to get a grip. I know. I've been told that, you know, if I if I have a war, even just a little one, in the next two years, then it'll be curtains, not politically. So I've just got to you know, take it one one day at a time, really. So now the rebuilding of Iraq can begin. As any builder will tell you, before you start building, you have to knock down what was there before. Done that. <laughs> As the Americans turned a blind eye, preferring to guard the more significant Ministry of Oil, Iraq's national treasures were looted. Thousands of years of history disappeared overnight, lost forever to looters who, in many cases, knew exactly what they were looking for. Who knows, it might even end up in America, whose Council for Cultural Policy, set up just before the war, had already objected to Iraq's policy towards its archaeological treasures, describing it as retentionist. <laughs> but now, thanks to the American military, Iraq can be rebuilt. What does George Bush make of that? I'm worried about the fact I'm running against an opponent who, in the same breath, talks about the U.S. military and nation-building. That was three years and two wars ago. <laughs> but George Bush is developing a taste for nation-building. We will work to help Afghanistan to develop an economy that can feed its people in the best traditions of George Marshall. But somehow Afghanistan seems so last year. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, the Red Cross have pulled out, the Taliban have regrouped, opium production has soared, and local militias control much of the country. Still, the Americans must be able to get it right one day. They point to successes in Germany and Japan, but that took years. And the Americans still have bases in both countries after 60 years. Back in Iraq, the Americans say they want to be out in 60 weeks. The Arabs want them out last Thursday. 
The problem is, if they do go quickly, they risk leaving anarchy or a hostile Islamic state. What do they do? Hand over to the United Nations? They'd sooner give it back to Saddam Hussein. Well, at least he's not French. <laughs> to quote White House spokesman Ari Fleischer, we will remain as long as is necessary, not a day more, but as long as is necessary to see a transition to a unified and peaceful Iraq. All the Sunnis hate the Shias, and the Shias hate the Sunnis, and the Muslims hate the Christians. It's enough to make a general cry, but it's a rocky democracy, something you've got to see. Hundreds of hostile groups will live in perfect harmony now. Saddam Hussein is gone. It's rule from the Pentagon. It's Iraqi as Big Mac and apple pie. All the Shiites hate the Baathists, and the Saddamists hate the Royalists. There's no room for the Loyalists or anybody from Iran, cause it's a Iraqi democracy, land of the young and free. Choose any candidate whose name is Ahmed Chalabi. The least that you can do is vote how we want you to. We made you free, now don't upset the plan. All the satirists hate the systemists, and the Daoists hate the scariest. The Americans hate the Islamists, and everybody hates the Kurds, cause it's a racky democracy, a new theocracy. Instead of shouting USA, they go to mosque five times a day. Hey, that doesn't fit the plan. It's like the Taliban. Look out, cause when the mullahs cry jihad, we might prefer the government they had. Dispatches, The Killing Zone, Sunday at 9 on 4. Well, for me, the, the, the worst moment was just before the war, when uh, Tony told me that if the vote went against us, we'd both have to resign, um, like a joint suicide pact. And um, th that, that really got home to me. Um, I think uppermost in my mind was, was, was the thought of all those poor people who could have suffered as a result. My wife my children, naturally, um, I think they would have felt the most appalling loss of income. And uh, But also, uh, let's not forget, my, my cleaning lady, suddenly deprived of, of her relatively generous six pounds an hour, more if she works weekends, and the au pair forced out onto the streets. And, and beyond that, my, my accountant and, and, and bank manager, a, a truly a, appalling human cost. Of course, luckily, that didn't happen. I, I survived. Um, the milkman got paid at the end of the week, and the order for the new city wasn't cancelled. And the Straw family, uh, this is a very important point, um, could breathe uh, uh, once again. Um, but it just shows, you know, how frightening war can be. So, the theory runs, a new Iraq will rise up from the ruins of Saddam's regime. Free, democratic, a beacon to the other nations of the Middle East, and a salutary warning to other tyrants and despots in the region. So, whose idea was it? After the 10th of September, America adopted a new policy, except it wasn't a new policy, it had been in development on and off for 30 years. Kissinger originally, but most significantly, Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and, through the 1990s, neoconservatives itching for the main chance. They found a spiritual home in a group calling themselves the Project for the New American Century, a collection of academics, writers and businessmen and, most importantly, members of the Bush administration. The policy goes right to the top, because that's where it came from. Back in 1990, before the last Gulf War, Dick Cheney, then Defence Secretary, now Vice President, was formulating a new vision for American defence. Now, it's quite hard to keep tabs on all these people, so to make it easier, we've devised a set of playing cards. <laughs> um, there we are. There's Dick Cheney. Uh, his advisers, well... Paul Wolfowitz, now Deputy Defence Secretary. Lewis Libby, now Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff. Donald Rumsfeld, now Defence Secretary. Trying to find a way to describe them, uh, we came across this. It's a quote from Donald Kagan, who's a Professor of Classics and History at Yale, former co-chairman of the project and a key member of its inner circle. So how does he describe American foreign policy with a reference to Tacitus? Historical insight, a gem of ancient Greek philosophy. Well, here's what he said. You saw the movie High Noon? 
Well, we're Gary Cooper. <laughs> now, he's just one of many people involved in American policy making in Iraq. Richard Pearl, founding member of the project, chairman of Defense Policy Board, faced with allegations of a conflict of interest, he did the decent thing and resigned as chairman. However, he's still on the board. <laughs> Elliot Abrams, the four of clubs there, supporter of the project, now special assistant to George Bush on the Middle East. He's on the National Security Council, convicted of withholding information during the Iran-Contra scandal. He was pardoned by George Bush Sr. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, you might think they're a bunch of harmless visionaries, but no. Many of their pet projects are already a policy. Everything from a 25% increase in defense spending to the development of small nuclear weapons. To quote a former State Department official, These guys are relentless. Resistance is futile. They had support in the Pentagon. They had support in the White House. All they needed was some way of convincing the public, something they themselves acknowledged. The process is likely to be a long one without some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Then September the 11th happened. Condoleezza Rice called together senior staff at the National Security Council and asked them to think seriously about, quote, how you capitalized on these opportunities. It didn't matter that there wasn't a connection between Iraq and the 11th of September. They'd find one. And if they didn't, the Pentagon had a new plan up their sleeve. In 2002, the Defence Science Board called for a proactive, preemptive group whose job would be to launch secret operations aimed at stimulating reactions among terrorists and states possessing weapons of mass destruction, thereby exposing them to quick response attacks by American forces. Need a vase? Need it in a hurry? You need Al's Vase Rental. Al's Vase Rental can service all your vase needs. Plus, we deliver free. Also available, photocopiers, office chairs, pictures of Saddam Hussein, and a wide selection of Iraqi state paperwork. Well, later tonight on Towards Freedom TV, it's a special edition of Friends, starring Ahmed Chalabi, Ariel Sharon, and George Bush. And that's followed by comedy cartoon capers with Mr. Hoon. People of Iraq, some of you may have become aware that during the liberation of your land, a small amount of collateral damage was suffered by your country's infrastructure. But hey now, here comes the good part. Because U.S. companies and their shareholders care as deeply about rebuilding your country as you do. And they are now offering you the chance to join them in creating a brand new Iraq. Just as in the past, we created the great cities of Rome or Paris or Disneyland. Perhaps you have a skill street sweeping or carrying bricks or serving beer. If you do, the U.S. Reconstruction Program for a New Iraq PLC has literally thousands of jobs in the vital reconstruction, retail, and leisure sections of the economy just waiting for you. Companies are currently recruiting in your area. Big names like Bechtel, Parsons, Fluor, Domino Pizza. Why not work for Halliburton? This man did, and now he's vice president. So, if you have experience in pipeline building, infrastructure, battlefield clearance, or public relations, have one or more arms, and a poor memory for American names and faces, we want to hear from you. One thing everyone was very clear about is that America must not be seen as an occupying force. So the last thing they'd want to have is a general in charge. So they haven't. They put a retired general in charge. <laughs> Lieutenant General Jay Garner. Now, he's got Patriot written right through him. His company provides the guidance system for Patriot missiles. <laughs> uh, not that he needs the work, as his company, L3, doubled its revenue last year as a result of the build-up to war. Already, US aid has started to issue requests for proposals, like tenders for contract to selected companies, uh, notably Halliburton and Bechtel. They're very popular with the Republicans, in fact, 68% of campaign funding for Republican congressmen in 2000 and 2002 came from just five companies. By an amazing coincidence, the same five companies that have been shortlisted for reconstruction work. 
Now, we already know that Dick Cheney was chief executive of Halliburton, who are still compensating him with up to a million dollars a year. Why? Well, for not being chief executive of Halliburton, for one thing. <laughs> but what about Bechtel? In 1983, Bechtel had a number of projects in the pipeline, including, funnily enough, a pipeline. <laughs> you know, this would run from Iraq to Jordan. They needed someone to discuss it with Saddam Hussein. That someone was our old friend, Donald Rumsfeld, who happened to be in Baghdad as a peace envoy visiting the Iraqi leader. He then reported back to George Shultz, who had previously been president of Bechtel, but left to become Secretary of State. He had since rejoined the board. Bechtel already has a contract in Iraq worth $680 million, and the total amount at stake for rebuilding Iraq could be as much as $100 billion. It's remarkable how many of the names advocating the policy stand to gain from the reconstruction. Let's go back to the cards and see the role of honour. Ray Hunt, member of the Intelligence Advisory Board, director of Halliburton. Lawrence Eagleburger, Secretary of State to George Bush Sr., Vice President of Floor Construction Company. Kenneth Oscar, former U.S. Army Secretary, oversaw Pentagon Procurement Budget, Vice President of Floor Construction Company. Philip J. Carroll, Chair of New Oil Advisory Board for Iraq, former CEO, Floor Construction Company. George Schultz, Secretary of State to George Bush Sr., Chair of Advisory Board of the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, Director of Bechtel. Jack Sheehan, Member Defense Policy Board, Senior Vice President, Bechtel. For thousands of hours, cartographers from the USA and other key approved affiliated states have been mapping our future. Already, Saddam Hussein's den of thugs and ne'er-do-wells has been replaced by a coalition of the carefree and willing. We aren't sure yet how this new state, Mini-Me, will work, but who's asking? It's on the map, and with its unique stripes and stars background, forms a beacon countries like Syria and Iran, or evil and pure evil to give them their formal geographical names, can copy. And you can bet they will, thanks to our policy of encouraging regime change, or as it's now called, war. From this, to this, and this. These fingers of hope, or oil pipelines as they used to be called, now push out across borders, drawing folk together. Thanks, Syria, says Israel, for letting us fill up with Iraqi crude. No problem says Syria. Hey, isn't it great to know pipe dreams really can come true? Now, if this was happening in Britain, people would say it's a scandal and demand that someone pay for it. In this case, the ones who are going to pay for it are the Iraqis, uh, through their oil revenues. These are the very oil revenues Tony Blair reassured MTV. MTV? <laughs> reassured MTV that the coalition wouldn't touch. Tonight we unveil the true story behind the most audacious conspiracy of modern times. The attempt of this man and his accomplices to trick the world and win billions of dollars in contracts and influence in the Middle East through an elaborate plot going back over 12 years. Now George Walker Bush to solemnly swear. It was in January 2001 that George W. Bush finally made it through to the hot seat. So help me God. So help me God. I remember even, you know, when he first made it onto the show, actually, um, there was a lot of talk about irregularities, about flaws in the way that, you know, he actually got on the show in the first place. It was, I remember it was very, very close between him and one other contender. But at the last minute, there was this, it was like a huge surge of votes from Florida or somewhere like that, and, and they, they, they checked it back and they went over, you know, all, all the procedures. And um, he sort of, he just turned up, he managed to hold on to his place. It was quite extraordinary. George W. Bush wasn't the first person from his family to get on the show. His father, also called George, had already appeared in 1988. And nearly ten years later, his brother Jeb got as far as Florida. But this time was to be different, and George W. Bush was determined to go all the way. I actually remember thinking, what an extraordinary person he was. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think most of us were amazed he managed to get as far as he did. And the Prime Minister of India? Uh, the new Prime Minister of India is, uh, uh, no. 
<laughs> by the 10th of September, he'd, he'd, he'd somehow got his way up to, um, I think it was about $16,000 or something. And, um, yeah, none of us thought he'd get any further. And then we had to break off because of the whole, um, you know, all the Twin Towers thing. And uh, he, he came back after that and, and straight away, almost overnight, you know, there was something, there was something completely different about him. Okay? Okay. Feeling good? Fine and dandy, sir. <laughs> Fine and dandy. Okay, you've got a plan. Yeah, I think I was uh, kind of too hesitant before. I was kind of worried about getting things wrong. Well, you're still here. In the studio, Bush had chosen to be partnered by Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld had also appeared on the program nearly 20 years previously, on a couple's show with the then president Ronald Reagan. He won the jackpot against all the odds with an incredible answer to the last question. Okay, you ready to play? Okay, so Saddam Hussein is a brutal and aggressive tyrant. Do you A, invade Iraq, B, introduce sanctions against his regime, C, go to the United Nations, or D, supply him with chemical and biological weapons? You know, I'm gonna go for D. You're gonna supply him with weapons? Sure. Final answer? Sure, final answer. Oh, Mr. Rumsfeld. The United States had a whole lot of contracts with Iraq. You can forget about those. You've now got a whole lot more. But Donald Rumsfeld wasn't the only supporter George Bush had in that night. Sitting around the stage, strategically placed in the rows of itchiest finger first candidates, were a number of influential advisors and aides, all of whom had links to a group calling itself the project for the new American century. I remember just after the show, we'd, we'd finished the recording. We're all in the, um, I think we're in the green room, and um, and they showed us a list of, of names: Richard Pearl, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, William Crystal, and you know, ev every one of them, you know, had links to this group of conservatives, all working within a few blocks of each other in Washington. As George W. Bush set about the last series of questions it became clear that he was being guided by this tightly knit group. Just how far were they prepared to go? We'll take a short break. OK, next question. Back in the hot seat, even with the help of his conservative allies, George W. Bush was still having trouble with the questions. OK, let's play. What was the real reason for invading Iraq? Was it A, regime change? Could it be B, weapons of mass destruction? Is it C, oil, or could it be D, links to terrorist organizations? Chris, I'm going to have to ask the audience. Okay, audience, you've got your buttons. Please press them now. <laughs> oh, well, that's pretty clear. So, uh, they say oil, but they could be wrong, George. George Bush decides to go through all the answers, but listen carefully. Well, I remember someone telling me they were dealing with Al-Qaeda. <coughs> but on the other hand, it could be about weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> I know they haven't found any, but that's uh, not to say they aren't there. <coughs> on the other hand, it could be about oil. Or regime change. <coughs> you gonna go for that, George? I don't know, there, there'd have to be a good reason for regime change. You know, like, like liberating the people or something. No? Nope. Well, that'd be a bonus. Or maybe just simply getting rid of someone who's a threat. So what are you going to go for, George? Going to go for regime change. You're quite sure? Sure. You're quite right, it's the right answer. As the amount of money involved rises, the next question asked, who would rebuild the country? Bush played the 50-50 option and was offered the choice between Iraq and the United States. Okay, George, there it is. You've got Iraq or the United States. Well, it could be the Iraqis. But I still think it could be the United States. Final answer? Final answer. He had contracts worth one and a half billion dollars. You've now got contracts worth four hundred billion dollars. 
With the final question looming, Bush had one lifeline left to phone a friend. So, you know, when the town called me, he told me it was the big one. And, well, everything was hanging on it, literally. What should be the next priority for Middle East policy? Is it A, Syria? Could it be B, Israel and Palestine? Is it C, Iran? Or could it be D, <laughs> North Korea? <laughs> and I knew the answer had to be Israel. I mean, we'd even talked about it before at Camp David and subsequently. And I just, I knew it was vital that he got that peace process started as soon as possible. So you're saying Israel? Yeah, 100%. Thanks, friend. It looked as though George W. Bush was going to go for Israel. But at this stage, the soundtrack gives a remarkable clue. Well, he seems to think it's Israel. No, <coughs> Syria. <coughs> Korea. Clearly, Bush's accomplices are divided. OK, it's the big one. The biggest question we've ever had on Trillionaire. Uh, by the way, George, what would, you, uh, what would you spend the money on? Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe tax cuts? <coughs> yeah, tax cuts. <laughs> Worth a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars. A lot of money, George. Are you going to play? Going to play. Oh, you're a brave man, George. Okay, he's going to play. He's going to play for a massive trillion dollars. Okay. Where does Middle East policy go next? Is it? Oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe. Oh no! After all. George Parr, you are a political advisor to the Prime Minister. I am. He, uh, he must be feeling um, rather satisfied at the moment. Uh, no. No. Oh, no. No, no. No, he always makes every effort to avoid feeling satisfied. <laughs> no, his life is a constant series of sometimes agonizing self-questioning. Really? Mm. Well, he's, he's worried that he's not doing the right thing. Oh, no, he knows he always does the right thing. Yes. No, what he worries about is that other people don't realize it. You see, sometimes people, for no fault of their own, uh, don't realize it. Because his overriding qualities are humility and courage. And he displayed those very vividly uh, in his relationships with the Americans in this very difficult time. What, by kneeling down in front of them? Um, oh, no, no. No, sorry, no sorry. by standing up to them. Standing up to them, yes. Um, yes. As, as, a moderating, as, as a moderating influence. Yes, it's on the record. Yes. I mean, he said to the Americans, I want us to have a second Security Council resolution. I want to have a Middle Eastern peace conference. I want to be consulted on the timing of the war. I want the UN to have a central role in the reconstruction of Iraq. Now, it takes great courage to say, this is what I want. Yes, and, and, and uh, what did the Americans say? They said you can't have it. No, no. <laughs> And, of course, that, that, that's where the humility comes in. It does, it? yes. <laughs> that's, it does. It does. It takes great humility to say, all right then, whatever you say. What are you, you say? Yes. Yes. And this, of course, um, puts him in an immensely strong position in Washington. Does it? In what way? Well, because, you know, he's called in all these favors, and they've said, we're not giving you any. Yes. Uh, which means that... Um, at the present moment, he can virtually ask for whatever he likes. Yes, yes. <laughs> and will that make a difference? No. No. <laughs> no, but at least he can ask. But, yes, absolutely. But of course, at home, here at home, because he is in a genuinely very strong position. Yes, well, he? he is at the moment. Yes. But that's another aspect of his courage, because mm. don't forget, there was a time just before the war when both in the country and in his party, he stood alone. Yes. But this again, you see, poses for Tony an immense moral dilemma. Oh, another one. Yes, yes another one, absolutely, absolutely. Because the fact that he was right and they were wrong mm -hmm. means, as you would expect, that Tony Blair knows better than the people he represents. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite see what the, the moral um, problem is there. Well, I mean, the moral dilemma is in those circumstances, is it right? for him to subject himself to the judgment of the electorate at an election. Well, when, when they prove to be so stupid, you mean, in the... In... 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it's taken them two months to realize how stupid they are. Yes. Isn't it? I mean, and you can't take that risk. I mean, it all depends at what point in the people's cycle of stupidity the election, the election comes. Yes, yes. Because if the election comes when they're at their most stupid, I mean, it could be a complete disaster for the country. Yes, yes. <laughs> but but un under, under our constitutional processes, the, the Prime Minister more or less does decide, doesn't he, on, on the timing of the election? Yes, but is that enough? Because mm. people can get stupid very, very quickly. Yes. <laughs> you know, I think the safest course might be for the Prime Minister to decide on the timing of the election mm. and then the result. <laughs> well, that, that would certainly simplify matters, wouldn't it? It certainly would, because he would obviously do what was best for the country. Of course he would. And he the one who, who knows best. He knows best, yes. George Barr, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> no, no. Who's there? Osama. Osama who? That's American foreign policy. <laughs> we know how much America supported Saddam and bin Laden before, but waging war on terrorism, having backed it, it's like raising pheasants with a shoot. I say, look, Clarissa, there's a brace of terrorists. It's after September the 11th. They're in season. <laughs> you know, when I was a lad, we had American support, intelligence, equipment, the lot. Is that all? <laughs> We had three billion dollars from CIA to fund our resistance fighters against Russians in Afghanistan. Ha. Not but three billion. Aye. They spent that on us in a weekend. You know, they supplied me with millions of dollars of pesticides in one year alone. Anthrax, botulism, gangrene, dengue, sandfly virus, West Nile virus, plague. They supplied thee with plague? Oh aye. Pneumonic and bubonic. Yeah, pathetic. <laughs> You know, they gave us a training complex with 35,000 Afghan Mujahideen, plus weapons, guns, everything we needed to wage a 10-year guerrilla campaign that gives inspiration to anyone wishing to overthrow infidel occupiers. A, a training camp? Aye. Oh, aye. You were unlucky. In 1959, the CIA recruited me, aye, told me to shoot Prime Minister of Iraq. Well, I was nervous, I missed the bugger. But they got me out of country until it was okay for me to return to Iraq in 1963 after some other bugger did the job properly. Aye. And you try telling that to people today. They won't believe, believe you. You see, look, American people see death and violence and terrible atrocities every day on the television screens. You know, Rambo and Lethal Weapon and what have you. Hey, some of those special effects are great. We should, we should try some. And the reason that they can handle those things is that those are those are fantasies. They don't exist. And the more that I can do to turn the real war on terror into the same thing, so no one can tell the difference, the easier it is for people to stomach. You see? Okay, folks, I got to wind up from the floor. Uh, always leave them wanting more. What was that war? <laughs> Last month, William Crystal, director of the Project for the New American Century, said, The mission begins in Baghdad, but it does not end there. It is so clearly about more than Iraq. It is about more even than the future of the Middle East and the war on terror. It is about what sort of role the U.S. intends to play in the 21st century. What's really meant is what role the world will play in America's future. Why can this president not see that America's true power lies not in its will to intimidate, but in its ability to inspire. Not our words, but the words of Robert Byrd, an American senator and former member of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> it comes to something when the most rousing words come from a man who used to wear a sheet over his head. <laughs> he continued, We flaunt our superpower status with arrogance. We treat UN Security Council members like ingrates, who offend our princely dignity by lifting their heads from the carpet. After war has ended, the United States will have to rebuild much more than the country of Iraq. We will have to rebuild America's image around the globe.